it's they're basically talking about moderation, but what role does hunger play in moderation? And how is this related to our previous discussions? Remember, so what we've been talking about in terms of building character is always what? Gauge. Right, the gauge, right? So when we talk about that gauge, what what role does hunger play in that gauge? If I want to reset my appetite, right? And when, when we talk about appetite, we're talking about appetite in a general sense. Whether it be appetite for the wor for worldly goods, whether it be appetite for food, whether it be appetite for women, whether it be appetite for knowledge, whether it be appetite for all of the things that we have available to us, how do I reset that gauge of appetite? By starving yourself. Huh, by, by, by actually starving myself. And what does that do? That helps. Huh, it resets that gauge. Because a lot of times it's difficult. For, if I just work on my existing gauge, what's the problem with working with the existing gauge? It's, um, you don't know exactly where you're at. Like right, it, it's going to be skewed. Right, that, the existing gauge that we have, if we don't push it all the way to the end, it's always going to be skewed. So we have to reset that gauge so that we get, you know, get back to that balance. And many times, you know, when we think, you know how, uh, like, for, for those of you who like coffee, you know how you tear the machine? Like, you know, to, to reset it, to get it back to zero? It's the same thing with us, right? When we have our internal gauges, but the problem is, if we don't tear that gauge and we start adding things, what happens to the things that we add and how we weigh them? It's going to be off, right? It's going to be off, it's going to be skewed, and we have to try to prevent that, right? That's the entire goal behind many of these discussions, and that's the importance of where hunger comes in. Because he said there are two shuffle, there are two appetites an individual has, and what are those two appetites? Or what, what representations does he use in, in this, in where we started our discussion? Do you mean food and lust? Uh, food and lust. Right? He, he's, he said these are the two main appetites that an individual has. They're food and lust, and now, right now, we're talking about food. Right? And we're talking about how to gain control over that. Because when we go into later chapters, we'll find that a lot of the, same, the strategies that he applies to food, he will also apply to lust. So he says that there are four duties. There are four things that will break, break the greed of the stomach. He says the first one is eating halal, okay, the quality of the food. The second is the quantity of the food, the frequency of the food, and the variety of the food. Is there anything here that you guys think we can add to this, or you think he's covered all the bases pretty much? Can't think of anything. Right, you can't think of any additions. You think was that again covered? Did he mean Zabiha Ah, he's talking about Zabiha, or is he talking about <laughs> he's talking about Popeyes? What's going on? What's going on here? <laughs> well, Ala Fikra, the Dali was what? What which method? Shafi. He's Shafi, so I think Popeyes would be good with him. <laughs> But you guys are generally right, right? I, I think that these four probably cover uh, the, the bases or anything that revolves around food and kind of how to deal with it. Out of these four, he's only going to talk about the last three. You guys have any idea why? It's assumed you eat halal. All right, uh, not just assume you eat halal. He's already talked about halal and haram in his previous mm -hmm. quarters, right? So we said that Ihya is split into four quarters. This third quarter is the one that we're talking about. So when he talked about ibadat and muamadat, those were in his previous books. So he that's where he actually discusses haram and haram, which is why he doesn't feel the need to reproduce that discussion here. Uh, so, referring to book 14, this is where he talks about the quality of the food, where he talks about halal and he talks about haram. Uh, quantity, what do you guys think about this? How do we gauge quantity? Even this, I think he puts into four levels. So, and he, talk he talks about reduction and how to reduce. But we'll talk about the levels also. But he says the goal is reduction. He says, regardless of where I am at, the goal is to, is to reduce. And how do we get to that goal? He's saying there are two ways of doing this. Either this can be done immediately. So if I go from eating like three meals a day, I go to half a meal a day. What do you guys think about that? It's not going to work? No. What, what do you think is going to happen? You go back to four meals. Right? It's unsustainable, right? This, this is going to fail. It's just going to fail miserably. It's not going to work. So what do you think is a more realistic way of approaching this? Smaller but true. Right, gradually. And, and, and this is something that we find even in the prophetic tradition, the Prophet Sallallahu he said the most beloved actions to Allah are? Small but constant. Small, small but mm. repeat, repetitive. So, so repetitive but even small. Consistent, yeah. even if they're small. Yeah. Right, so a lot of times we like you know, conflating the small and consistent. It's not necessary that it be small. Yeah. It's important that it is consistent. consistent. Right, because it, gradually this is closer to the the nature of an individual, 
right? Like we are, we as individuals, we're used to gradual change. Who are the people who are used to immediate change? Usually extremists, right? Like <laughs> jumping from like one end to another. So it's usually, if I find myself like constantly like jumping around back and forth, I think I really need to do like an internal check to see where I'm at, to see where I stand. And he says gradually, this is something that is actually sustainable. This is something that an individual can continue with. This is something that an individual actually can do. And, and this is something that's really important for us to, to keep in mind. Because sustainability is what we want. Right? Islam is a, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. sprint. Mm -hmm. uh, so he says there are degrees of quantity. Uh, he mentions four. That which sustains life, a half a wood, uh, one wood, and between a wood and a man. Uh, so the one through four, one being the highest, four being the lowest. I think uh, we're all on level five, uh, we're just <laughs> which is discretionary, <laughs> where we kind of figure out how much it is that we want to eat. But what, what do you guys think about this breakdown? Is it realistic? Is it not? I don't think it's really realistic. You don't think it's realistic? Okay. Why is that? Because if someone wants to eat like half a month uh -huh. for, for the rest of their life, I mean, Probably you can live off that, but I mean, like, you call them skin and bones. Okay. So. Not healthy. It's, it's not a healthy lifestyle. Um, you think that an individual will be, like, all skin and bones if they do that? I, I'm, I'm okay with that. My question is now, who is, he, who is this for and who are these degrees for? Uh, every, every one, everyone decides for himself, herself, what, how, what to choose. The, the reality is, like, we all have to be discretionary, like, at some point, right? We, we have to determine where we want to be. Because can a person get to this level? I think so. Right? I, I think, like, even, even non-Muslims are able to do this. this. This is not just a uniquely Islamic thing. Even non-Muslims are get to this level where it's like, yeah, you know, I just eat once a day. I just eat, like, you know, just enough to, ju I have just enough caloric intake where I'm good and I'm able to function. I'm able to move forward. I'm able to do a lot of these things. But when you talk about increasing on that, how is that increasing to happen? Or how does that increasing happen? And how do I decide where I want to be? Again, this is going to be discretionary. This is something that we do have to decide where we want to be. And, and this is for somebody who wants to travel that path. Right? We had already we had already talked about the way of Sadiq or the one who's seeking to draw near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His path is always going to be what? Up and down. Not just up and down, it's going to be individual. Right? It's, it's not necessary that if you're here and I'm here, does it matter? Really? No. Because what is the overall goal? Closeness to Allah. Ah, to draw near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Be, the idea is that we, we want to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more so that what? He loves us more. And we have to determine which of these paths are going to get us there. Because if I eat this much, and I'm upset, and I'm cranky, is that going to help me draw near to Allah? So I need to determine where I'm at so I can be functional. Because along with all of these things, what else am I going to be doing simultaneously? Good eating and praying. Right? I'm, I'm going to be doing other good deeds. Right? There are other things that I'm going to be doing in my life. And if I want to be able to sustain to do those good things, I need to figure out where I stand here. I need to figure out how much it is that I need to consume. I need to determine my intake so that I can actually sit and eat what is important for me to get to where it is that I want to go and to get to where it is that I want to be. So quantity is important. Um, he, he does mention this with him. He does. He said that you can't get to a point that's discretionary. Well, even he mentions that this can be problematic. Why do you guys think that is? We tend to be too like lenient ourselves. Remember we were talking about that gauge? Like if, if I know that my gauge is skewed, and I know that my gauge is off, and if I'm discretionary, what are the chances of me overindulging or under eating? Right? It becomes that much higher. And that's why it's important for me to reset. Uh, so basically, like I said, it's eating when you're hungry and stop when you're feeling greedy. And we said that there was a problem with this, right? There's a problem in stopping or determining when to stop eating. 
If I stop eating when I feel full, what has already happened? Past the right. I'm already past the point. I'm sorry, I already ate as much as I was supposed to, like ten minutes ago. The the problem is that the for that signal to get from my stomach to my brain, it took it took some time, right? Because there's food that's actually traveling down, and because of that, because of that time delay, I've already passed that point. So the, determining that gauge is something that's important, and there are other spiritual tools that Allah has given us to help reset that gauge. What tools do we have? Right? Fasting is something that's really important. Not it, it is a spiritual tool, but it also has a physical effect. It also has a mental effect. And because of those effects that it has on us and on our lives, it's something that helps us reset our personal gauges. And if we're able to set those, reset those personal gauges, it helps give us direction. It helps give us understanding. It helps bring us to where it is that we need to be. You know, wherever it might be. Frequency. How often should we eat? Huh? Three times a day. Well, that's, well, that's, well, like between, well, between, that's what I'm talking about. Between those. <laughs> so, <laughs> he's on the other extreme, right? He says you can go without food for up to three days. Some, even seven, ten, or fifteen. Uh, up a little siyam, siyam, and dawud. Right? The best fasting was the fasting of dawud. How was his fasting? Every other day. Huh? He would? Every other day, right? So he would fast one day and he would break his fast the next day. Uh, two to three days, you can go without food. Next level, limited to one meal a day. And that's it. There's no more levels, by the way. <laughs> like he doesn't mention any more levels. I, I threw in the fourth one, like, it's basically anyone who eats more often than that. But that's fine. There's, there's, I, don't, I don't think there's anything wrong uh, with that. But, uh, it's, it's important, again, that everybody determine their own gauge. Um, and the one who is limited to one meal, he says that this person should eat before Fajr. Why? If you are in support. So you pass, right? So that's, what, that's what the idea is, is that if you limit to one meal a day, you know, you just eat before Fajr comes in, and that way you can pass the entire day, and you can break your fast. Wait, before Fajr meaning like, so it, he's talking about consuming a meal. He's not talking about like you know. So if you eat, eat a day or drink water, you can still break your fast, but it's not. It wouldn't be considered a meal per se. And, and, and remember, just put put this in perspective. And we, we had talked about this. Some of these examples come across as very extreme, right? Yeah. Like so, how do we put this in perspective? What is it that he's talking about? Remember, what is the purpose? To reset. How to reset our personal gauge. And he's talking about how often does this need to continue? Not too long. Right? It doesn't need to continue. Like, it doesn't have to be our whole lives. When is this implemented? When we become lustful at times. When, when we start feeling that we are falling into our desires. When we start feeling that we're losing control. When we start feeling that we are giving preference to this world versus the next. Because all of this idea of hunger, what did you say in initially? Hunger is what? Do I need to go back to chapter one? I think not. You guys are killing me. <laughs> are killing me. He said that hunger is a? It's a treatment. When does the treatment apply? How when we're sick. It's not something that an individual takes his entire life. And who needs to take it their entire life? Those who need more treatment. Right, those who need more treatment. Because even amongst people who are normally healthy, like so a person might be a cancer patient versus a person who has a common cold. The person who has a common cold, how much treatment does he need? Versus the person who has cancer. Right? So this is going to be significantly less and it's going to be vastly different. Chronic condition. Right, so you have people who have a chronic condition. And like, I'm pretty sure most of us do. <laughs> so, uh, so we had talked about uh, that, granted, there it can become difficult. Right? It can become difficult, it can become problematic. But if we understand, again, it's important to keep that lens intact. If, if Ghazali is talking about the, this idea, he's talking about it within that lens. He's talking about it within that focus. 
that when we deal with these things, when we speak about things, if we treat that, if we make it out as a treatment, it becomes very different than making it a lifestyle. So variety. And he mentions now a bunch of different narrations from a bunch of different scholars on how they dealt with this idea of hunger, how they dealt with this problem of hunger. Because if hunger is a main, if food is a type of shahwa, and this, the hunger and lust are the two, two evils that drive us, how do we contain that, right? Because they can be used for good. There's, there's, nothing, there's nothing to say, yes? What, what is shahwa? Shahwa is it's general appetite, it's like a desire. So he's saying the desire of two types. He's saying that there's desire like a like a food desire and a lust desire. And these are the two desires that really drive an individual. So how the idea behind this entire section is how to break those two desires. And how to gain how to gain mastery and control over them. Because is it good to have a desire to seek knowledge? Yeah, absolutely. Right? Is it good to have a desire to do good deeds? To be socially, you know, to be socially conscious, to to be brave, to be loyal, right? All the good these are things that we should all strive for, that we all work for. And if we understand that these are things to work for, lusting after them and wanting them and desiring them are things that can be channeled in that way so that they are. Uh, so the goal of limiting variety is, again, having that sense of personal restriction. You will have the number of narrations that we talked about of individuals staying away from certain types of food. Why do you think that's important? They didn't say stay away from food. You'll find them saying that I tried to stay away from this type of meal, I tried to stay away from this type of food, I would try to stay away from this type of drink, I would try to stay away from this type of condiment. Why? Not to get used, not to get relaxed and lean, uh, not to get attached to this world. Uh, not to get attached to this world. Right? That, that's, that's a very clear thing. Like, if I enjoy steak, what should I do? Shouldn't eat too much. I should, not, not only should I not eat too much, what is, it, what is a good way of dealing with it? I just don't eat it. Stay away from it. For how long? As long as you can. As long as you can. And I, I would add to that. Not only just as long as you can, as, as long as that love stays in my heart. And the difference between eating it and not eating it becomes the same to me. Because at that point, what have I done with that desire? Detached. Huh? Detached from it. Not, not only have I detached from it, I've conquered it. And if I can learn to conquer this one desire, I can use that same technique to conquer others. By others. And, and that's the goal, right? To gain control of these desires so that the shaitan does not take advantage of us. So that the shaitan does not ensnare us. Because if we understand that the main motivation for an individual are his desires, and we get control over those desires, what tools does shaitan have left? Right? It becomes difficult for it becomes challenging for him because the tools that he had to kind of pull us and ensnare us are gone. Uh, so placing foods into levels, who places those foods into levels? So what book can I go back to to give me the levels of food? What levels does that mean? Meaning what like, you know, this, this is like high quality, this is, this, is, this, is, this is like high quality food, okay. this is less quality food, okay. you know what I mean? Like vegan. You know. <laughs> <laughs> huh. How, how do I how do I determine those levels? What books can I go back to? Anything? Yeah. Uh, nutrition books. Nutrition books. Okay. What are the books of nutrition like? Uh, what are the nutrition books tell me? They'll tell me like caloric count. Will it taste me? Will it tell me like the taste of the food? It's like this is excellent. You want to really stay away from this. Hmm? Yep. Um, I think I think the quality. Who's this book written for? All of these concepts, who's he addressing? Oh, he's so addressing ourselves. Like this, he's addressing the individual. Who's the one that puts these foods into these levels? I do. I have to determine. Right? Just because I love steak doesn't mean anybody else does. There might be other people who match me on that same level. But there are others who won't. There are other things that will be more attractive to them. There are things that they will like. For them, if you present them steak, they're like, I don't want to eat this. Right? They'll, they, they don't want to. So we have to determine those who it's like. And he, he puts these, in, even on top of that, there are other things he puts into those levels. Just because I like a certain food, there are certain sides that I'd like to go with that food. Every time I eat fried chicken, I want coleslaw. Right? And every time I eat fried chicken with my coleslaw, 
I want some Louisiana hot sauce. These, these are the things I want to eat together, right? Do you, you see how this happens? But the fried chicken, is it, as, is it as good without the hot sauce? And is it as good without the coleslaw? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe not. Some people don't like it, right? Some people don't like eating with that. Some people prefer it with fries. Some people want their fried chicken with a side of fried chicken, right? It's, it, it's, 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 everybody's different. But the only way for, to determine that is me as an individual. I have to figure out what level these things are. And once I determine where all of these things fall, and how do I determine that? How would I even go about doing this? Yeah, just look at your heart and how it attach your heart to these books. Okay. If I look at my heart. Then when should I look at my heart? When you desire that thing. When I desire that thing. And you'll find in a lot of the stories that are narrated, if you guys if you guys read some of the narrations, they said, this food was presented to me. This food was brought to me. I smelled such food, and my heart became attached to it. I saw this food in a dream. <laughs> you have narrations like that, right? I saw, and even in my dream, I tried rejecting it. Like to, to that extent, they really wanted to remember kashlok shahwatein, breaking the two desires. And if I want to break those desires, I have to work that much harder at breaking them, because the idea is breaking that love, breaking that connection with this world. I understand that I live in it. I understand that I have to navigate. I understand that there are things that I want to do, but I cannot let those desires do what for me? Take, take control. Right? I can't let them take control. I have to what? I have to take control. And when I take control, those things that I desire can actually become tools for me to draw near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, should an individual prohibit himself from desirable foods? No, no, that's not the idea. Remember, we, we had talked about hunger is a treatment. Hunger is a treatment for a problem that we all face. And if we understand that it's a treatment for all of us and all the problems that we face, is that we have to make sure that we are creating that balance. And the reason we don't indulge in them, does it mean that we can't consume them from time to time? No, that's not what it means. But we have to get to a point where we can control it and someone and how do we know those things control us? The moment somebody asks us, hey, let's go eat this, and I'm comfortably able to say, no. But every time I'm called out, I will, I'm ready to drop and leave everything that I'm doing to go, get a, to go get a burger from Duke's counter. I already know that there's a problem. Or to get a steak from Silver Diamond, right? You know, there's so many things that attract us. There's so many things that draw us. If I'm ready to leave everything, for that food, then I need to recognize at that point that I have a problem. And I need to work on it. And the moment I'm able to determine that, then I'm on that road to recovery. I'm on that road to success. Because that realization, what did we say about the realization? It's what? Describe that balance. He says, describe that balance is just like staying on the sinat al because it is tidal, it is balanced. That what is the essence of this religion? We are balanced in every way, in every shape, in every way. Whether it be our interactions with ourselves, with our families, with others, with non-Muslims, the larger community, we're always going to be balanced. And because we are balanced, we're always going to want to seek balance. So. 
And we have all of these narratives, right? We have all of these stories, we have all these narrations. Basically, they, they train themselves to create this sense of appreciation. And when we had talked about, when Ghazali had talked about how to actually raise children, he said, what are some of the most important things that we instill in children? This idea of? Shyness. Uh, not just shyness, more than that. Appreciation. And? Uh, Self-discipline and delayed gratification. And what is one of the things that we complain so much about this generation? Everything. Huh? Everything. They're what? Everything. And we complain about everything. <laughs> but one of the main things we complain about is that they're spoiled. Right? Well, number one, who made them spoiled? <laughs> like we did, right? There's, it's not like the kids are spoiling themselves. That's, that's not what's happening, right? Number one, we're the ones that are spoiling them. Secondly, we never instilled, even many of us, the way we are today is because we were denied things, not because we received them. Right? When we're denied things, like in the Ulul Azam, right, the great prophets, what are the six shared characteristics between them? If we look at Noor, if we look at Musa, if we look at Ibrahim, if we look at Isa, if we look at Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what is something that they all share? Alright, they're all tested. Good. Struggle. The struggle. Like their lives were not easy. Like you look at some of their stories, like their lives like really sucked. It was really hard. It was really difficult. It was extremely challenging. Like they face struggle after struggle, after difficulty, after difficulty. Even some of them, when did they truly see success? Even when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away. How much of the Arabian Peninsula was under his sultan, was under his command? You guys know? It was just Makkah, Medina, and Baif. Talking about 23 years of struggle, 23 years of doubt. And the only thing that he had to show for at the end of his prophecy was with these three cities. The rest of the Arabian Peninsula was at war. Nuh, alayhi salam, how successful was his journey? Have like a handful of people who follow him. And even with the success that Musa a.s. had, how successful was he really? Constantly, constantly in engagement with, with Bani Islam. Ibrahim, thrown into a fire, thrown out of his land, thrown out of his land again. <laughs> right? Just, just this constant struggle. Yusuf a.s. another beautiful example. Why did the Prophet, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take him out of his home? Why did he throw him into a well, sell him to slavery, put him in jail, right? Just problem after issue, after problem, after, you know, adversity. Because at the end of the day, adversity, what does adversity do for a person? Right? It makes them strong, right? It builds their character. And one of the, like I said, one of the problems that we have with every generation, right? So this generation is not the first to receive it. Our parents complain about us the same way. That you didn't have the problems that we faced. You don't understand the difficulties that we went through. And many times, if we catch ourselves, like, you don't know how good you have. I mean, I know how good I have, right? <laughs> right? But, and, and that trickles down. Before, you know, my dad used to yell at me to turn the AC off, you know, turn the fan on. Like, you know, you, you would hear those. Now, when I feel high, I just tell Alexa to turn the AC on. And, and what happens? Like, my kids, they're affected by that. Because this is the lifestyle that they're now used to. So how do we teach them to appreciate it? There are different avenues. I mean, without torture, right? That's not, <laughs> the idea isn't to torture our kids. The idea is to help them appreciate those things. So every once in a while, having a plain meal. Right? That's one way of doing it. Or buying them plain clothes. How humbling is it for many of us, like going going into school with like Bela shoes, right? So like, it's, it's a humbling experience to not be the one who has Jordans. Kids are so mean. And and kids, kids are mean. Kids are ruthless. <laughs> no, no, kids are ruthless. Like you know, and they are. They're they're absolutely ruthless. But what is going to happen to the child that experiences that versus the one who is spoon fed his own life? Right. The ruthlessness is real. I'm not I'm not here to deny that, and I'm not here to encourage that at all. But we have to. Many times step back and put things in perspective. Is it better for me now to help my child understand, like, okay, no, I'm going giving into social norms or standing against them? Even Islam, it came to challenge the status quo. It didn't come to preserve it. 
and if we understand what it means to challenge the status quo, and helping our children become stronger, this is something, I mean, these are strategies that are, that are meant to help us. I remember one time uh, I, was at, I was at my cousin's house, and she had, she had given everyone food, and I was eating, I was like, man, this is really salty. She's like, oh, okay. She picked up the plate of food and walked away. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, wait, like what, what, just, what, you know, what just happened here? Since that day, I've never complained. If I don't want to eat something, I just won't eat it. That's kind of too much for me. But everybody's going to have different experiences, right? For, for some people, it might have been harsh. But for me, it was really appropriate because I learned from it. For others, it's, it's like, you know, with, with my kids, we have a different strategy. If they don't eat, I'm like, cool, no problem. Saran wrap, put it in the fridge. And like, to be continued. You know? <laughs> that was the worst. <laughs> and, and, and that's just how it is. You know, like, there, there are different strategies for different people. Um, it doesn't work so well for my daughters, though. They just have, like, end up having a lot of food in the fridge. <laughs> so there, there are different strategies that we have to try with different people because everybody's different, right? And we can't, we can't think that, okay, well, I did this with one child, therefore I was going to work with the next child. That's not how it is. If we understand that we're all individuals, we need to understand that they're individuals too. So each of these individuals, they st struggled with a specific dish. And we had talked about this. Why is it that each person has a specific dish that they have problems with? Because we as individuals are attracted to different things, right? There are specific foods that each of us like. Even our palates are very different, right? Some of us might like, might like Western food. Some of us might like Eastern food. Far Eastern food. Eggplant. I'm sorry, eggplant, right? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> there's so many things that are out there and so many choices of different types of food. What I like is going to be very different from what you like versus what she likes versus what you like. And, and this applies all across the board. I have to determine what it is that's my issue. Because the idea isn't the dish itself, right? That's not that's not the goal. The goal isn't for me to stop eating steak and baked potatoes, right? That's, that's not the goal. What is that steak and baked, baked potato is supposed to represent for me. It's supposed to represent my desire. And if I'm able to control those desires, then I'm able to control it in any situation regardless of that. Does it mean that I won't fall short sometimes? No, there's no guarantee. And just because I was able to conquer my food, doesn't mean that I'll be able to conquer my other desires. And how many desires are there out there? For, for some people, you know, it's drugs. For some people, it's alcohol. For some people, it's women. For some people, it's gambling. For some people, it's lying. There's so many things that will trap us. Yes. For some men, on men. I'm sorry. For some men, on men. Yeah. No, for some men, other men. For, for no, girls. No, for girls. Yeah, you know, and, and, and it's a real thing. Yeah, a lot of protectors. So I mean, but it's important to recognize that that just because there's different desires out there, the important thing we have to learn from breaking this one desire. Can I apply that strategy to these other desires that might be more harmful? Because remember, this dish is essentially what? What is the hokum on this dish? It's permissible. It's hadat. And this is a very specific type goal that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us through the fast. Because the idea behind it is that if you're able to prevent yourself from something hadat, it should be that much easier to what? Ha, to prevent from harm. Allah is showing us. He's telling us. He's like, listen, you did it. You can do it. You can actually stop. Not just that. That not only can you do it, but there are people who preceded you that successfully did it too. But it's much more difficult to stop yourself from doing something mm -hmm. bad rather than good. Then we have to ask ourselves why. Why is it more difficult for me to stop myself from doing something bad than doing something right? And I think that that requires a lot of introspection. So why am I more attractive to haram, attracted to haram things than I am? Those things which Allah has prohibited me from for a short time. And am I not taking the lessons that I should be taking from that fast? Because for some of us, fasting is just a chore. And for some of us, fasting might even be easy, right? Like not eating, not drinking, it might not be a problem. Like I've, I've lived in countries where like they just sleep all day. <laughs> like, you know, they'll, they'll eat their big meal before fajr, price lots of fajr, bam, wake up like, if, if they're good, they'll wake up before Asr. If they're really bad, they'll wake up after Mother. Right? <laughs> it, it depends on the culture. So, you know, for them, like such a person fasting is not a challenge at all, right? Because they, they slept most of the day. But am I taking the lessons that need to be taken? And, and there's a reason that, that
that Ghazali is even talking about a lot of these specific desires. Because this is something you actively have to do. Fasting for some of us can be a very passive experience, especially during the winter months. Right? It might even fall into our regular eating schedule. Now you're talking about like sometimes 4.30, right? So like 6 o'clock, you pray Fajr. 4.30, you're going to break your fast. For some people, it's not even a fast. It's like, what, that's, what time, that's what I normally eat. Like, that's what I normally eat breakfast, and that's normally I eat dinner. That's fine. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, he's given us a window to make up on us. Whatever time of that window you utilize is completely up to you. It's the same thing with prayer. Allah has given us a window for prayer, right? We should try to pray within that window. That's all. So th that specific dish, this is be going to become something a little bit more active in our lives because it's something I'm actively trying to avoid versus, like I said, for some of us, how the fasting can become a very passive experience. So um, I really liked this uh, quote that he had taken from the Muslim majority. Uh, we said, about about one so one of the Sufis visited the Muslim jury and asked him, what is Zohid? So he replied, what have you heard about him? So I quoted him several statements and he remained silent. I said, what do you have to say about it? He said, know that the stomach is like the world for the slave. As much of his stomach as he is able to master, that is the amount of zuhud that he has mastered. And the extent of his stomach that masters him, then that is the amount of dunya that masters him. It's the same concept we have been talking about time and time again. Either I am going to control my desires, or my desires are going to control, you. control me. So creating that balance, He's saying that one of the way of creating that balance is that every time I eat my fill, I should always associate it with worship. And I thought this was a really interesting strategy. The moment that I fill my stomach, immediately he's saying to go do what? Uh, go do some type of ibadah. Whether it be dhikr, whether it be dua, whether it be praying, whether it be reading Quran, I should immediately associate it with that. Why? So each time you eat, remember Allah. Ah, remember the reason that I'm eating. And for some of us, it might be a way to expiate. Because we might be overeating. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has categorically prohibited this upon. And Israf, I don't, I don't know if I mentioned it in this class or the other one, Israf is something that is always going to be subjective. Every time I indulge, every time I indulge, it is always going to be subjective. Now, if I bought a Ferrari, for me, it would be a slaw. But for somebody who's a billionaire, if he buys a Ferrari, would it be a slaw for him? No, right? It's, for him, it's just something else that he's going to spend on, something else that he's going to buy. Like for me, buying a yacht would, would be a slaw, right? But for someone else, it might be something that's normal, or something that they, you know that they can own, and it's something that's very attainable. So he's saying here that eating one's fill, it, it's possible that it reaches a level of a slaw. And the way to deal with that slaw is to balance it with worship. And that worship should be fed by that food. Right? Because we're always looking to strengthen ourselves. It's going to be very difficult to worship if I am weak. And again, that's not the goal. The goal here isn't weakness. The goal here isn't strangling ourselves. The goal here isn't starving ourselves. It's not the goal. The goal is to essentially is to worship. And if we're able to connect these things, it'll help push this in perspective. It'll help us prevent from It'll help us to stay balanced. It'll allow us to stay healthy. Uh, and then he closes with a couple verses, which I thought were uh, you know, very nicely related to what we're talking about. Uh, that you squandered the good things you were given in your earthly life, you took your fill of pleasure there. He's talking about the kufat here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very specifically talking about the kufat. But are there certain aspects here that can apply to? Just because something applies to the kufar, it doesn't mean that we cannot benefit from it. It doesn't mean that we can't take lessons from it. We have to make sure that we were given this earthly life. And he's saying, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that from, from the characteristics of the disbelievers is what? That they squander their earthly life. 
what should we understand from this as Muslims? That we don't squander and we don't waste. And he said, and not just that, you took your fill of pleasure there. So you took your fill. Does that mean that we cannot enjoy parts of this life? No, we can. But what, what is the difference between us and the disbeliever? Overindulgence. Not overindulgence. Right? Meaning that we don't take our complete pleasure in this world. Why? It's temporal. Not because we know that, the, that most of our pleasure will be in the Yeah. Uh, here Allah SWT says, كُلُوا وَشْرَبُوا هَنِيًا بِمَا أَسْتَقْتُ مِنْ أَيَّا قَالِيًا It will say, eat and drink to your heart's content as a reward for what you have done in days gone by. He uses this as a very strong proof for the things that we prohibit ourselves in this world, that we will be what? Rewarded. Uh, we will be not only rewarded. Compensated. Uh, we will be compensated for those things that we have prohibited ourselves from in this world. That if I stop myself from fulfilling my desires, if I stop myself from certain things that I love in this world, Allah will not only compensate me in the next world, He'll give me what? Reward. Not just reward. He'll give me more. And the quality will be infinitely better. So uh, I think this is the this is the last verse. This is the last uh, point that uh, the value of the time talks about uh, related to this. Uh, we'll, we'll stop here. Do we have questions? Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, how is the levels? Sure. Levels of. So uh, there are certain foods that we I, uh, this is where I think I use the fried chicken example, right? <laughs> so certain food, like for some people, fried chicken is on the top of their on top of their food chain. And not only is that good, what adds to that experience? The coleslaw. Mm -hmm. And what adds to that experience? The hot sauce. So a combination of those three things that is my top tier food, and that is something that I strongly desire. Like I will leave everything. Get some good fried chicken coleslaw with hot sauce. So what what should my job be? What should I do? I try to avoid it. Or I not just try, I actively avoid it. Why? Because I need to train myself to break that desire. Because if I train myself to break that <coughs> desire, I can use that same technique to apply to other desires. Yeah. So um, something about like if you prevent yourself from doing something in this world, you have, you know, everything, like, for instance, if I prevent myself from drinking alcohol, yeah. I'll get in here after. Ah, so it's yeah. the opposite of I, like, if someone drinks an alcohol, they yeah. won't get in here after. Yeah, so it, it can apply, it, they can be, if an individual indulges in those things which Allah has prohibited in this world, then he will he be given those things in the hereafter. Wallah uh, alam, that there might be a delay or the quality might be that might not be the same as person versus somebody who has actually denied themselves. I, I, I don't know how that would actually manifest. I mean, it's, it's something of the unseen. All I do know is that the things that we, we deny ourselves in this world, we will be given in abundance and greater quantity and quality in the next world. So how that would apply to somebody who indulges in those things a lot. But I, I know that there's there will be it'll it'll fall short in some way. I just I don't I don't know how that would actually be. Yeah. I have a question. Um, I was confused about the, the guy, the Sufi, who visited um, Fox and I don't know. Sufi? So yeah. Okay. Can you go back to that and sure. explain that? No. no problem. So, basically, in summary, what he's talking about here is that the individual who masters his desires versus the person whose desires have mastered him. That's all he's talking about. Oh, okay. And he's saying, and what is he saying to use as a gauge? Hi, he's like using the stomach as a gauge. He's just using that as an example. Okay. Saying that, hey, if you're able to master this, then you're able to master the dunya as well. Because one, one of the ways to actually manifest Zohar, right? Zohar and asceticism, it's a very abstract concept, right? Like, you know, there are certain things in Islam, like taqwa, Zohar, like they're, they're very abstract. So he's trying to give an example to kind of say, okay, hey, this is one way of actually manifesting the Zohar. And, and what is that? Having control over the desire. Right? He, he's, essentially what he's saying is Zohar, Having control over your desires. Yes. I'll, I'll come back. Yes. So uh, you were talking about how if you prohibit yourself from something like 
dunya, you'll be given it. You'll be given it like in the year after, yeah. after and even in greater quality. Uh-huh. How would something like gambling be given to you? So gambling, maybe the payouts will be bigger. No, no, no. I'm being serious. Like you know, for example, like if if you hit big, then you'll get like seven Earths. But I'm, <laughs> I'm saying like you would be gambling in Jenna. Yeah, I mean if we can drink wine in Jenna, right? If we can have multiple partners in Jenna, right? There, there's so many things that in paradise that we are prohibited from having in this world, and we will not only have in the next, we'll have in excess. So, is this one of those possibilities? Yeah, absolutely. Why not? Yes. Oh, I think so. I'm thinking about you know, Azubat and uh, and the example about the stomach. I think so. Who is playing in this part about our body? How we think? Yeah. And this how we think is you know we think how we are gonna able to uh, engage ourselves to the right way is. It's about it comes to the part you know uh, how to control our sins. Yeah. I think so. I don't know, but no, no, same. I, I I agree with you one hundred percent because basically Lazadi he he premised this entire section calling it kasa kasa shabate, mm-hmm. right? So the two shabat that he said was one of them was the stomach and the second one was was lust, and he says hadan yabuda, right? He, these are the two things that pull us faida istafa and then kasa wahid. You know, you can use the same tariqah and tariqah of that. And now the things that are pulling you, you, you broke the reins and you have full control of yourself. Right. Yeah. And because what are the things that pull you towards sin? It's your shabbat. Mm-hmm. Right? It's the shabbat that pulls us towards sin. If I know how to break my shabbat, am I going to be pulled to sin the same way? Yes, there's, yeah, go ahead. So is it the ultimate goal to not even want the rewards of the hereafter? Like, so you, you have some people who express that, right? Like, you know, I, I'm not concerned with the hereafter, I'm only concerned with the love of Allah yeah. love and stuff like that. Those are just extreme expressions, right? You, you know, so, so basically what happens is that when somebody's writing poetry or somebody's writing, you know, they're writing in a way that they're like, they want to be fully immersed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love. And when they talk about that, they want to talk about it, they talk about it in such an exaggerated way that they'll talk about and remove those things that even we're supposed to see, right? Okay, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he tells us very clearly, he says, when you ask for paradise, ask for firdos. Why? Because it is the mid, it is the med, uh, middle and highest part of paradise. So even the Prophet Sallallahu is telling us to see paradise. He, even he himself, so said, he used to ask for paradise. So to see those things, I think that's something that's very natural, something that's very normal. But sometimes in the heat of the moment, there are certain things that people will say out of exaggeration. I don't, I don't really think it's meant. And the reason I say that is because it's mentioned in poetry. And every time somebody writes in, in prose, anytime somebody who writes in poems, they don't mean it. Like they don't mean it like literally. It's not, it's not meant to be sat down and be like, okay, you know, like you know what I mean? Like this is some academic research that I need to sit down and explain. Like he's just expressing what's in his heart at the time. You know, but if you sat down, you have to ask them, like, yo, bro, like, you don't care about paradise? But, nah, man, come on. Like, <laughs> I was just in the zone, you know? But what if paradise yeah. is just the means of you being close to law? Like, I find it weird yeah. to, like, be motivated by horries and, and yeah. drinking wine and here after having mansions. Like, yeah. what I mean, you? I kind of am, so. <laughs> 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 like, what do I do with that? Like, that's, I mean, that's fine. Give, give us the to us, inshallah. Give us the give to us, so don't worry about it. It's a, so the thing is, like, it's, it's important to understand that everybody has different motivations. Right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has basically given us a buffet of motivations. Like for, for some people, bodies are important. For some people, land is important. For some people, security is important. For some people, having silk garments is important. For some people, having jewelry is important. For some people, having wine is important. For some people, having gardens is important. Right? You, you understand? Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has basically divided it.
high-end, wealthy, intellectual, high, high mind. Yeah. yeah, you can say, oh, you'll get to have wine, food, all of that. Yeah. I, you can say, I would have had that. What is appealing yeah, about it's it is not to exactly. me. Exactly. That, those people, yeah, for those people, yes, a lot in the process, yeah. you get to see me, you get yeah. the business and that. But I, for sorry. others who are pretty poor, who don't have anything, tell me about seeing a lot, yeah, so that's pretty cool, but yeah, I'm yeah. hungry now. And, yeah, in, in, in some, yeah, for some people it's enough to be like, immortality is amazing. Right, just that concept. Yeah. Just that idea. It really depends. No right? disease. Like, yeah, like no disease. Like, what about like, probably very No old age. A lot, a lot. A lot of interest into experiments. I mean, um, uh, any other questions? Yes. Uh, this is it, yeah. Actually, are, are you in the WhatsApp group? General ruling is disliked, isn't it? And what? The general fifth rule for overeating, yeah. because people will say, "Oh, it's haram." It's not true. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, yes, it, it, would, it would be disliked. It would be disliked because you have narrations where the Prophet ate and spilled. You have narrations of Rehna specifically, he ate and spilled, drank and spilled. So it's okay to do that. Indulgence is a problem, but indulgence is going to be subjective. You know how we determine that individually is going to be. There's going to be change. It's going to be different. Uh, you know, are apples permissible? Is it permissible to eat 12 apples in one sitting? <laughs> you know, so that, that, that might be haram. <laughs> well, but, to the point know, when you harm yourself. Yeah, yeah, you know, because, why? Because at that point you're like, you're harming yourself. Medical approval. Right, you know, it's like, you know, you could actually get like cyanide poisoning. You know, it's like, there are like real problems and real issues that are associated with that. Yeah. So I, I think there, there is a line there when you start entering self-harm mm -hmm. where it becomes a problem. Mm -hmm. Again, any other questions? I have to do that with coffee. With coffee? Yeah. You have to drink 12 cups? Like, what, at what point is it impermissible to be chicken and switch coffee? I, I, will, I will tell you my personal experience. Never. When you start going like this. That's <laughs> happened to me. Right. Like, when you, when you get to this point, you need to stop. Like, that's, that's you, you, you reach the jittery point. Drink chamomile. Uh, drink chamomile. Chamomile? Chamomile tea, yeah. Uh, oh, chamomile tea. Oh, okay. I thought you said chamomile. chamomile. <laughs> I was like, wow. Uh, it's, it's a, I, I think that'll stop me from drinking coffee because it'll just get too expensive. <laughs> Anything else? Plus, then uh, we will break for slot. I'll see you all next week. Inshallah.